Um, here we go, so you know who's up here next to me. We'll give our panelists uh, a chance to introduce themselves in more depth in just a minute. But uh, I wanted to start by um, putting it back out on you. So it's, this morning's panel is exploring some questions. Can living in community also provide new opportunities for shared ownership and affordable housing? And how can co-living spaces amplify projects that improve neighborhoods and reduce environmental impact? These are big questions. So I wanted to start by um, giving you all a chance, very briefly, in just a couple minutes, to turn to a neighbor, since we like to do that kind of thing, and think about one experience that you've had in a community-like setting and what was meaningful about that. It doesn't have to be in a you know, housing cooperative, but any time in your life when you had a community experience, whether that was at school or on a sports team, uh, with your church or synagogue or faith community. So everyone, find, find a neighbor, maybe someone you know or someone you don't, and, uh, and just take a couple minutes to share one experience that was meaningful to you in community. Do you have a roommate? Do you have one? Well, I have a roommate, I
snap twice. You can hear me snap twice. So, well, yeah, a lot of smiles out there. That seemed like it was a good, good conversation. So, conversation on commiseration. <laughs> yes, community is challenging sometimes. So I'm going to um, turn it over to our panel this morning. We'll start with uh, Lonnie Gray, who's going to be speaking about Zoe Dwellings, which is an exciting project that she's running. No, we're, we're actually going to start with Ben and Jay from Open Door. They're going to tell us the story of their project. Then we'll hear from Lonnie, and, and then we'll have a chance to ask some questions and uh, perhaps have more conversation. Um, so I think there's some PowerPoint slides. Have access to those. Um, so, if Ben and Jay, if you could just uh, introduce yourselves personally a little bit more, and then tell us uh, about your your work. Sure. I don't think we need the mic. Um, so, Open Door is a little company that creates. Actually, yeah, yeah, we're recording. Yeah, is this the right source? Yes. Yeah. This is what you can use. Sweet. Oh, there's one here too. This one right there. Great. I'm also this part of our. Yeah. Sweet. Um, so we create community living spaces um, for about a year, a little, a little bit in a year, and we have um, some houses that are leases, and then most recently we just bought a house in Oakland. And um, the sort of purpose behind what we're doing is that when people come to live together, it's not just about sharing food and sharing resources and lowering your rent. It's about the support that you get from living your, your entire lifestyle being surrounded by community and the new connections and opportunities, but emotional support, intellectual support. You get you know help with your projects, sitting over dinner, and you're it's really we're a social species, so we're supposed to be living in community, and it's only since the Industrial Revolution that people have been living in these nuclear families and cut off from that sense of community. Um, and I think also, like, since a lot of society has been moving away from going to church, there's no outlet for gathering together. Um, so we found that community, there's so many people who are hungry for living in community, and it's really hard to start a community living space. And so we decided to be full time on helping to start those kinds of spaces. And I would add, because the this conversation is about both collaborative living and then shared ownership. Um, so far, we focus really on our the, the operating model for community, which I think is a very non-trivial um, challenge to figure out. How do you really support communities coming into being that are authentic? And have resilient cultures and bring people together in really positive, healthy ways. Um, and so we've been we've been setting up sort of that knowledge base, and then headed towards the direction of uh, shared ownership. But I think one of the interesting challenges is that there's a whole body of um, legal barriers and structures and opportunities. I think to get get more creative on that front. I think we can talk more about that in the Q and A, but. Um, combining community models with the deeper, deeper levels of structure and the ownership of the real estate layer, I think is sort of a, a huge opportunity that we're excited to be working on. Um, so I can dive in a little bit into the possibilities that um, the future holds for community living. I've had you know, doing this for the past year or so. We've talked to a million sort of real estate developers and investors and people who are community living advocates and you know government officials and so many people have looked us in the eyes and be like, I really think you guys are onto something. <laughs> I think this is the future of housing. Like not a sideline thing, like there's gonna be a fringe group of people who just like this is the the like core shift in housing and lifestyle. And I think that that's particularly true that we're finding right now for the millennial generation. Like, everyone I meet who's between the ages of like 20 and 40 is like, what, when's the spot opening in one of your houses? Like, how can I live in this place? Because everybody wants that. 
little bit strange, but <laughs> like, so many people are excited about it, and it's just our even physically we have a housing stock that's like two to four bedroom houses that are structured for a uh, sort of single family lifestyle. And so we found this incredible challenge, like our, our kind of like sweet spot is houses that are above 10 bedrooms, like not a lot of like, <laughs> 16 bedroom houses. We found a couple. Um, the house at Berkeley is actually 16 bedrooms, which is crazy, um, but it's, it's hard to find. And you know, Ben and I have kind of a sustainability background and came to this mostly from the sort of like social and cultural power that happens when people come together. And like, I'm always like, there's like a lot of heartfelt energy where you're like, wow, I actually feel like I'm affecting people's lives and people that will come to us and be like, thank you so much for helping put this community together. I, you know, I grew up in a, with a single mother, and I've never been like seen as a person, as myself, so deeply before as having these 13 people around me who I call family. Um, and sorry, I, I, my brain lost what I was talking about. I got emotional. Um, I, don't that. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember, but I. I <laughs> Oh, so we, we have a sustainability background. Yes! <laughs> the, the other aspect that we're finding really exciting is how, in addition to the human, social, cultural awesomeness that we think is community, there's also a really powerful sustainability story with people sharing space together. Um, it's just a way smarter way to use space and increasing density, but also a lot of the, you know, the sharing economy is super cool and huge right now and you know we'll make VCs ever drool, but I think it's in a community space where you are bringing people together in a much more intimate and uh, uh, sort of tangible way. Uh, a lot of that happens very informally, and so we see already in our houses um, how people are sharing their stuff, and you know you can have one washer dryer between sixteen people. That's a lot less washer dryers in the world, and just think about all the ways that that multiplies with cars and. Dishes and, and so forth, and so it's a really great way to sort of swap out consumption for relationships and experience and sharing. And I think that, as we think big picture, um, we need those kinds of models, uh, and housing could be one major leverage point for that. Uh, and then I want to share a bit about some of our projects because uh, just to kind of ground this and tangibly what what we've been doing. So um, we've been around for about a year a little less than a year, and we've done three houses. Two are still currently in operation. The first was called the Sandbox House, which was an eight-bedroom house in Berkeley, and uh, was basically the prototype for the whole company. It existed before the company, and Jay and I, uh, okay, so we have slides. Um, Jay, Jay and I um, sort of used ourselves as the test customers, so we, we lived there, and um, it was a really amazing way to try out some of these ideas. And the basic concept was uh, combining a home environment that supported people and living more in alignment with what they're passionate about. We, we call it the three I's. Um, like how do you live an inspired life that makes the kind of impact you want and then also produces income or supports you financially. And then combining that as uh, with the whole idea of home as a, um, a hub of sharing and how we can live more sustainably and affordably that way. And from there, we had a lot of success. We were able to find people easily. We just kept kind of being surprised at how much interest there was and how people really did want to come together in the community. And so we started Open Door to create um, a company that could help with the real estate and with the community startup and operations and begin to make community a little bit more accessible. Uh, so the second house we did is the farmhouse, and it's in Berkeley. It's a 16 bedroom. Oh, it's up there. Yeah. Perfect. Um, uh, 16 bedroom Victorian that got remodeled. Uh, we signed a long term lease, and the property owner is amazing. She remodeled it specifically for community use in mind, and uh, found us because she she thought we'd be a great match. So uh, it's rare to have a landlord that that you have that kind of um, values alignment with, um, and that. That was a really powerful experience for us in how to start a community that we didn't live in, and how to be in a facilitation role, and how to set up 
really great structures, financial structures and legal structures to empower the community to um, have really healthy relationships and then also to focus on what we call higher order problems. Like getting the sort of the day-to-day challenges of sharing finances and sharing space, kind of just solving that so we can focus on how do we create an amazing culture? How do we support each other? How do we have more projects and events and companies come out of this this home? How can this be a supportive, vibrant environment? Um, and that project for us um, has been a really fantastic flagship to be able to both to build our own confidence, but also to be able to show others what's possible. Um, and then currently, Jay, I think you mentioned this already, right? We um, spent the better part of the summer um, getting into ownership and uh, purchasing a building with um, uh, some private investment through friends and family. And, um, learned an amazing amount very quickly in the real estate financing and development process. And um, it's called The Canopy is the House. It's going to open January 1st, and we're remodeling a mixed-use building in Oakland to be uh, custom-made for community living. Um, and then also, part of that, we're playing with this idea of including a commercial space in the community space. Because we found typically the common area in a living space, uh, you know, an ideal living space has an amazing kitchen living event space that sort of becomes the hub. Um, we found that acts that has a lot of different uses embodied in one space. It's a dining area, it's an event space, it's a co-working space during the day, you can do projects there. And so we saw the opportunity and the need for there to be a more uh, explicitly, um, a space with a use being explicitly for commercial activity. Uh, I would also add that it's like a semi-public space. So there are a lot of people who are members of the community who don't live there. And that's really valuable both to the people who live outside the house and the people who live in the house to have really great friends coming over for dinner and being able to have events. And that's it's not just about the people who live there, it's actually really about the broader community. And so having like a sort of semi-public, semi-community space where those people can really plug in easily is something we're really excited about doing. And I'm going to go off on a tangent from that because it answers one of the questions, Chris, that you said, like how can community spaces facilitate a broader sense of community in neighborhoods and cities and things. And um, The way that we're approaching community is, is much more, I would say, extroverted than a lot of the, I think, 60s and 70s models of like going off into Mendocino and starting a commune and like, getting away from it all. And, um, and that's really beautiful, and I think the whole intentional community eco-village movement is, is, is awesome. And we're playing this idea of having these urban integrated communities that um, are much more open and have various ways to invite people in and become hubs of broader community and sharing uh, within the place that they are. And um, so that, going back to the commercial space, uh, that's a, you know, in some ways we're kind of um, pushing the boundaries of what you're supposed to do with real estate, particularly residential real estate. Um, so having a, a dedicated commercial space makes it you know, much more um, within the rules of how you're supposed to use real, real estate. Um, and I'm going to take this opportunity to make a plug. Um, we are looking for people or groups that are interested in using that commercial space, whether for an event or even having a uh, more significant relationship. Um, so co-working, maker-type activities, we're really excited to invite people in that aren't just part of the living community. So I'm just going to put that out there right now. If you, you are someone or know someone that I think might be interested, give us a ring. And we're going to make the space available probably for most of the month of November for free um, to like bring the community in and be like, what do you guys want to do here? And what should this become? And in that process, um, sort of find the, the group or the business or the tenant that um, is excited to take that on and be a part of the community. So I know we've been doing a lot of time on the past to you guys. Now, uh, thank you. We'll pass it over to Lonnie now. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Hi, I'm Lonnie Gray. Well, let me start with, I have been um, a home redesigner and space planner since the 80s. Um, it happens when you marry someone who's six foot nine. It doesn't get into the world. 
Just to paint ceilings like this. <laughs> I did. I painted everything below the wainscot level. No, that's really good. Um, it's true, it's true. We had a place up in Washington State. Um, I started Zoe Dwellings. I've been in design for a long time, um, both from the business and financial side as well as from the design side for a lot of years since the 80s. And um, I've come to believe that American housing has to change, that it has to not be a burden. It has to start, start to be a support to our lives. If we're going to live meaningful lives, it has to, and it can't step up and be a part of it, which means we have to think about design differently. So to me, collaborative living and the idea of coming together is one opportunity in which you can live a more intentional life, but it has to be designed in. Um, I almost worked for Katie and Chuck McCammon, who, who kind of brought the co-housing model, if people are familiar with that here. And I discovered that around that small little idea, which was a fabulous idea, this gigantic intentional community idea was developing. But we were pouring ourselves into houses that were built for single families. So something had to change. So what I'm trying to do as a dwellings is work from the bottom up and from the top down. And by that I mean that I'm trying to get into groups like this wherever I can to start a conversation going. So we start to talk about what do we need our houses to help us do, number one. I want to hear the things you've tried and the barriers you've hit. On the other side, I'm also starting to work with cities and I'm actually starting a campaign on a state level to change language in our laws and our ordinances to encourage those people who want to go into collaborative living in some way, get help. Um, because our laws are written and still the mindset is one unit means it holds one family. So I have actually petitions that if you're game to sign, they're informal right now, it's just a show of interest that we're doing two things. So I'm starting my conversations, I'm working with cities now, um, the city of Albany, I'm starting to talk to the city of San Francisco. We're trying to talk and advise cities about thinking outside the box, the box of one house. Um, I think I've said pretty much what it is that I do, and are we ready? Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Turn around and there it was. Um, if you were here yesterday, there was a lot of heady stuff going on. Um, we were talking about courts and business structures and how to think about money. Um, I want to do something different. I want to do something different. I'm going to ask you questions. And I'm going to show you pictures. In fact, I want you to think about this as sort of a, a podcast with you to <laughs> because I want you to go inside. I want you to pull from yourself and make choices. Because obviously you're here because collaborative living is of interest. So well, let's see where this takes us. And yes, I'm a Luddite. I'm actually using those. Okay. When you think about the next place you're going to live, what do you see? Is it the myth? Is it the burden? <laughs> or is it the possibility? And I want to nuance the conversation. I mean, Ben and Jay, have, they have it right. Um, but a lot of people, when they talk about collaborative living, we've all had it, and I don't know the discussions that went on at the table between you. We've all lived together to share expenses, to make you know that first place out after the parents, beyond the dorm room, whatever it turned out to be. But I'm talking about something different, something I call zone dwellings. On your table, I threw a card. If you would reach for that card and flip it over, I call the process of zone dwelling something a little different. Have you ever lived in a place that actually worked to satisfy you and nurture you? 
And have you ever lived with others that intended for you to take a step forward in the life that you intend and wanted to do it themselves as well? That's what so doing is about. That's the way I define it. Yeah, we all we all make great connections, we get social community, all those good things. But I'm talking about dwelling, stepping up to the bar and helping you and living a more intentional life. So let me ask you a question. If you were to consider, or would you consider collaborative living after your single nomad days, when you're living in places like the farmhouse? Okay, you found the one. <laughs> Maybe you got married. Maybe you want to have kids. Maybe not. Maybe you just found a group of people who you so resonate with that you want to spend a long time living with. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. I need privacy. I need more than the space around my bed. I need time. I need it to be a sense of my place. I need to find myself while I'm there. So, obviously, you have to do that. But what if I was to say that collaborative living is actually a step in that direction? A step to finding yourself and to giving you actually more time and more privacy. It requires, in essence, two things. You have to start to understand the real gifts of the group. And you've got to have good design specifically, specifically for collaborative living. So the gifts of the group mean that you get to use them and they get to use you to live intentionally. That's not a bad thing. Obviously, I think you've all known that when you live together, the redundancy of chores falls away. We're not doing it in parallel. Now all of us start to rotate through one activity, cleaning, gardening, whatever it is. It can be a chore, it can be a task you like. It doesn't make any difference. But the point is that you get time back, and you get to rethink how you want to use that time. We share the cost, we get the savings from that, but you also get more choices. Okay, this is my kitchen. My kitchen is shared by seven. And this is not a staged photograph. This is, <laughs> honest to God, this is my kitchen on Saturday before the Sunday night cleaning. Wow. Okay? I clean my kitchen once every seven weeks. <laughs> my kitchen gets cleaned every Sunday night. And that's only just one chore. What would you do if you had six more evenings out of seven? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. I know a young attorney who's having her second child, almost momentarily, I think, real close. Yeah. She lived cooperatively as a couple in Chicago, and then when her first child was born. And now she's moved into a house that she shares with another family. And she hopes to buy it cooperatively at some period in her time. She's growing her new profession as an attorney. And she feels living cooperatively is the best way that she can be a wife, a mom. She only gets to do half the, the uh, child care and the chores. And she has time to grow her home-based profession. For her, the idea of living a family in a family of four four adults and two families gives her exactly what she needs. It gives her more choice. So the point here is that you don't need a whole village. You can make this work with one supportive person or family. And it gives you more <coughs> balance in your life as well as more time. So then the question becomes, what would you do with that time? This is what my housemates and I do. They go hiking, they go camping. That picture of the party on the side happened last month in our yard. Um, we had a traveling garden show in which traveling musicians came and did for us. And we also pull in from our entire neighborhood. Um, I'm sitting there with a friend, but also there's about seven or eight neighbors that just said, oh, we can come because we just outreach and said, come, we're having a party, come be a part. And they did. And besides that music, if you look real closely, there's a beer sitting on the ledge over there. 
Um, my partner, TJ, has discovered that one of our housemates is totally into artisan beer. So very often they have beer tasting sessions. OK. So the other aspect of this that I find really important is that you have to have space that flows for many. So look at the before and after of my kitchen. I've taken redundant and wasted space. Look at that empty wall for crying out loud. And I converted it into private areas of private storage and counters to work with, and I created a multiple use kitchen. And this is just a single family house. I didn't build something special. I move as much space as I can. Can we get that gone? Thanks. Um, I move as much space as I can into private rooms because we need that to counter. And I personally work very hard with the people I work with to build their passions into their lives. So let me give you a couple of ideas of how this works. Whoa, something is happening. Can we move forward? Is that good? Try not. Don't let it happen. Oh, these are good pictures. You don't want to miss them. There we go. OK. All right. We're jumping through. OK, this is a single family house. It's a five bedroom. It's 2,890. It's just under 2,900 square feet. And I redesigned it to this for four families. It's um, a couple on the bottom floor with the sort of tangerine down to the right. They have a part-time adult son that comes back. And each of the other zones, then there's um, uh, Dan has a sort of new person in his life, so he's an almost couple. And then Josephine and Barb are both individuals. Each of these zones is 450 to 526 square feet. That's two and a half to three times the size of your bedroom. Probably. What would you do with 450 square feet? Plus, of course, you have the 850 pounds. I will also add that unlike micro units that have become so popular in the marketplace today, um, all of our situations, we actually have full-size kitchens and full-size bedrooms and real storage and rooms where you can invite someone else in without having to make your bed. You know, all those kind of things have a kitchen. We can be ecologically responsible and not have to give up uses that are important to us. The next thing, I'd like to tell you a story about this, a very brief story about this family trio. Their house looks typical, um, their Oakland house, from the street, but inside it's a scholar's library. It's a chef's kitchen, and it's a dance hall. David, the man on the left, is an academic translator of old texts. Michael, in the center, is a very dear friend, and he's an exquisite chef. I don't think he was trained professionally, but I don't know. But oh my god, it's fantastic. And Sharon adores everything that has to do with English country dance. She calls, she teaches all around the day. So they built these loves into their house. They do not have a sofa in their living room. The living room has been designed to exactly fit the lines and squares of country dance. And occasionally, the Thanksgiving table when Michael cooks Thanksgiving dinner. Um, the kitchen is an exquisite chef's kitchen. His quarters are behind there and separated. And for David, um, he has a room as a part of his master suite that has gorgeous high ceilings, natural light, walls of books, and a huge desk that allows him to translate and open up the text he's working on with all of his reference materials. And it's just steps away from the living room. David is starting to get frail, and he can't travel with his wife and dance. They all love dancing. And what happens, happens with this family is that they can bring the dancing home. And if he wants to be a part of it and can't come down and dance, he can open his door, and the music wafts up, and he's a part of it. And if he can come down for a period of time, he can. 
Sharon is free to be able to go all over the Bay. She does. She's gone and all across the country four and five times a week um, calling dances. And um, she can leave and know that Michael and David are there together. There's no problem. And then Michael has just folded his friendship and his companionship in and has put it into this. So the question, the two points I want to bring here are, who is your family? What are they comprised of? And in what way can you choose to bring passion into your life, build it into your space, and you can't? The last one is my house. This is my house, and a few years ago, I transformed this old Victorian into a house that beyond my partner and his adult son, I now have four other housemates that bring amazing things to me. But I've lived in this house as a single person, as a single family unit for 14 years, and it's kind of weird to all of a sudden shift. So what does that feel like? This is my studio now. It's not squeezed into a spare room. It's not squeezed into a two no long and narrow sunroom. Um, and it's not cleared off the dining room table every time somebody comes. I have more workable space than I've ever had now that I live with other people. And this is some of their spaces. Privacy spaces can be put anywhere. That's one of my writing desks. This is my and my partner's private seating area away from the commons. Uh, almost privacy. <laughs> and that's another intimate side room. What would you do if you had a room just to yourself? And lovely side rooms don't have to be inside. So what I'm essentially saying here to close up is that we need to choose how we want to live and we need to design it into our lives. Collaborative living is a really good way to reach for that and do it. And to so dwell means you do a task less frequently. But when you do do it, you're actually doing it as a gift to others as well as yourself. So let me ask again. Would you consider collaborative living or possibly even co-owning after your single days? I hope so. Because the more of us that do this, the more the demand is created in the market, and the more we start to get what we need. We need to shift this, and we need to create this way of living together. So, what can you do? Um, you can join the conversation. Um, my website is going live November 10th, and I want to have a place to converse and hear what's happening to you, what you're trying. It's really important. And you need to find a group. Now is the time. Find them, date them, <laughs> take them places, spend money with them. <laughs> Sit down and talk about how you live and want to live alone and together. Go to those resources that are all over the bays about how to buy collectively and how to rent or, or own collectively successfully and save your money. Save, save, save. I know it's so bloody expensive here. Despite what you think, the market is changing and we can talk about that during the course of the Q&A. Um, but things are going to be loosening up in the next couple of years. I'm fairly sure of it. Um, and you want to position yourself well so that if you want to go this route, you start to have some capital. The other thing is, um, share those stories with me. Let me know. I am trying to start a credit union or a fund specifically to fund the design, building, and long-term mortgaging of collaborative living. And so we need to hear what you're hearing so that we can deal with it. I want to hear your explorations. Collaborative dwelling is of the vernacular. It's of us and is by us. Thank you. Let's talk. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit more about myself and the work that we're doing at the Sustainable Economies Law Center because it really does bridge these two presentations. So, um, SELC, as we refer to ourselves, um, 
in the general sense, we are working to cultivate a new legal landscape that uh, supports grassroots economic empowerment and community resilience. One of our 10 programs is, uh, it's called the Rethinking Home Program, which I co-direct, and it's working um, to support innovative and sustainable approaches to housing. Recently, we've been really playing with this idea of the commons and what would it look like to manage our housing as a common resource. Um, so to that end, we offer uh, free legal advice three times a month for projects um, like these, people who are starting housing cooperatives or limited equity uh, cooperatives or eco-villages. We um, offer these walk-in legal clinics in the East Bay. You can check out our, um, our website for all the times and locations. So if any of you are interested in starting a project like this and need some free legal advice, please come see us. We're here to support you. We also do advocacy because as both, uh, both of these presenters mentioned, there are significant legal and regulatory barriers in place to collaborative and shared ownership structures. So uh, we recently helped uh, have a bill passed, AB 569. It was a three-year process. The final bill was not quite what we envisioned, but it does remove some significant barriers to the financing of housing cooperatives. Um, it's a step in the right direction. I'm excited to hear that there's more um, advocacy work going on out there. And we're really getting into the idea of, of helping to create replicable and innovative um, governance structures for shared housing. So that's something that we'll be working more on in the future. And land as well, because housing sits on land. So we need to address that issue. So with that said, I wanted to ask um, a couple questions and get a little bit more, and then hopefully we'll have time to hear from the audience as well. So th these are both really exciting. I, I was feeling inspired and, and touched as well. But I also wanted to pull in some of the other conversations that we've had throughout the event so far. And it's hard to talk about housing without also talking about access, affordability, race and class dynamics. You know, these are real. Oakland, you know, it's actually one of the most culturally diverse cities in the entire country. So I guess a question to, to everyone um, and to the audience as well to think on this is how can these kinds of um, collaborative approaches to community living actually reflect the communities that we live in? And you know, more pointedly, how can we ensure that new types of collaborative living don't negatively impact the communities that they exist within? So I'm, I'd like to hear some, some thoughts on that and whoever feels moved to speak. One, one thought on that is, um, you know, Jay and I come from a sustainable business background, so we, we're, our, our domain of work is in sort of market-based approaches, um, which we're excited about because of the potential for them to scale and to, to compete, you know, uh, regardless of whether Austin regulations pass or not, which hopefully, hopefully these structures will start to be created. So one of our interests in collaborative living is how do we create a market-based approach that also delivers more affordability just through better usage and design space. So that's that's one thing we think about a lot is how are we um, economically empowering residents and um, you know one thing uh, we've done our house is that we have a guest program uh, that brings in additional revenue that then goes back to the house to use for common purchasing or to pay uh, utility bills and things like that for now the cost of living. So in that way, um, we're able to you know, lower the cost of living um, independent of what the actual market pricing is, is doing because that, that's a huge variable that you know, is going up and down depending on where we are in the cycle. So as an initial thought, that's one thing that we've thought a lot about. I would say on the um, visionary ownership side, we're having many a uh, super geeked out conversation about like how can we redesign the, from the ground up the way that real estate works and the way that real estate investment works. And um, the thing that I keep coming back to is like gentrification happens because a house is sold and it's sold for a higher amount, which then requires higher rents. And so, how can you actually? 
just stop buying and selling houses so much. And instead, like like you were saying, sort of more of a commons approach. Like, I, I, my, my vision would be a network of communities and, and properties that are collectively owned by not just the people who live in that one single property, but in sort of the broad geographic area. And if you want to move from one to the other, you can, and you have to sell your house to do that. And it's such a hassle to, you know, if you're just say, say you're a couple and you own a house and you want to move, you have to go through this massive legal and financial process to sell your house, buy another house, finance it. Like, it's so unnecessary if you have this sort of cooperative ownership system that allows you to move more fluidly. And I think in that process, and you're not recapitalizing things and paying more interest and taking out more money that then fuels sort of the, the growth economy that, um, that has led to a lot of these problems. So I don't know how to do that, and I think that's a big legal question. Um, you could probably hack it together somehow. Um, right now, we're really small companies and we're focused on just like creating more communities, and, and hopefully in the future, we get to play with more of these higher order problems. Um, I think um, one of the ideas I've tossed about is the idea of a corporation for, for collaborative living in which you buy and sell shares so that you could literally move from one space to another if you so did so, if you chose to do so. But the other aspect is reusing the building stock. We have big, amazing buildings, and a lot of people, because of our Prop 13, are almost trapped in the buildings. They can't afford to move because their taxes go up tremendously. Why not restructure these and make these different forms of housing? Um, I have, I won't show you the slides, but I actually have a series of slides that show that the cost, if you were to buy a million dollar house, which is not unusual here, right, or more, in the area as a single family, you would need in, in excess of $180,000 of earned income for that household just to qualify for a traditional loan. And your monthly, if you were to put 20% down and carry an 80% mortgage at like 4.5%, would be $5,600 in change for your mortgage, your insurance, and your taxes. If you take that exact same house, in that exact same neighborhood, wherever it is, and you divide it the way I divided that house up to four families who each have to therefore only earn an income of $56,000 to qualify for that loan. They only have to come up with one quarter. And it doesn't have to be equally distributed. It depends on the mix that you create. But then the quarterly rent that each of them would have is $1,650. And I think there are actually micro units that cost more than that these days. But it lets you, in terms of gentrification, get beyond. You get to choose what neighborhood you're in. Because four people can live with 1650 with privacy. And they don't have to be ousted out. Even if it's rental. I live with rental people. I adore it. It's what we refer to, my partner and I refer to it as, our creative flow through. I wish I could keep them longer, and as I find people who wish to buy, we're going to do a lease to own partnership, and we're going to transfer. So again, we have to pay certain taxes for the transfer of ownership, but we don't have to sell our house and pay 10% for selling costs. We're going to say, come, be a part of us. So there are ways to stay where you are and not necessarily trigger the sales and the upping. Or you can sell it off. That corporation idea can also be anchored to a land trust. Great. Um, one of the really exciting threads that I heard in both of these was um, the multi-use design of space. and. I think that's really important, particularly as we're all concerned about relocalizing our economies and how better a way to relocalize than re to deeply embed our economic practices in the home itself. Um, so you, you had a chance to talk about that, but I wondered if there was any more thoughts on how we can um, really reintegrate production, consumption, distribution into the home itself. 
That's like a whole conference on this one. Yeah. <laughs> and we have 10 minutes. Okay. Um, I think that's that's the question that we're asking with this new commercial space um, on the ground floor of the Oakland property. And I think the other question that um, that we're asking for that one, like Ben and I, two straight white males in America, um, going into a neighborhood sort of five blocks east of Lake Merritt, which is a Vietnamese community, buying a building, totally renovating it, and then who's going to live there? And what's going to be in that commercial space? And just by the nature of sort of the social networks that we have right now, um, that's a big question. And so I think not only the question of of what are we producing, but who is producing it, is is something that we want to experiment with that ground floor. Um, and so, I, I would say I would I would bring that question into action and say it's such, such a huge question, and invite sort of that dialogue to happen over the next month or so, um, and experiment and prototype and try to bring different voices together and um, and have that be an opportunity. Can I throw in something? Yes. I'm part of the transition town movement, and I believe that each individual can be a local asset to their community, and it works from their home. And you choose what it is that you want to do, whether it's food or baking. And we're doing making sessions later. And then you anchor it in your home by design, and then you amplify it out into your community. And by doing so, you're sharing it. And the last piece of that for me is succession, that you train your community in, in any way that you want through mentorship in order to pass it on so that when you're gone, whether you shift or you die, it stays in that community. And that's a, a fabulous way to use our housing and our buildings and our own passions to localize our lives. Thanks. We have uh, time for two or three questions from the audience, so I'd love to open this up. And uh, there's a lot of hands, so I encourage people to be eloquent in their brevity. <laughs> and I saw the first hand here. Okay. Uh, other three questions. Maybe, okay, so maybe project, yeah. and I'll try to repeat. One historical correction: uh, in the late '60s, early '70s, '80s, there were urban. Uh, cooperative houses that had very much the same profile that you're describing. I lived in an artist community where we had a big kind of space and we had all kinds of events. We had classes, dance events, happenings. I mean, so that existed. It's, it, it, it's not a new thing. And um, the second thing that I'm curious about is your ownership structure. For you, is this like a straight up business, regular business model where you're the owners with help from your family? Or is there some kind of shared ownership structure to what you have? And then you made a comment, the last thing is that you made a comment about living in a predominantly, or five blocks away from a Vietnamese community, but something about your networks. You made a reference to your networks, like, so I was curious about what are your networks in terms of living or commercial space use? Sure. So that, uh, just in case people didn't hear the question, um, so a comment about the historical context of urban communities. What's the, the ownership structure of Open Door, and what networks do you all currently exist within? In terms of the diversity factor, open diversity. Sure. Um, I'll do the networks one. Um, so, so the comment that I was making is basically like the the group of people that I'm in community with now currently to be super frank, is not that diverse. And so I simply don't know the people to bring in, and so that's part of why I want to be here and like put this onto a bigger radar, because there's so many people within the community that I already know who are like, can I have the next bedroom, and they're my friends, and there's a lot of pressure to be like, um, yeah, sure, you can move in. Like, um, So putting the word out broader is, is part of what I'm here to do. Um, and do you want to speak to Bill actually? Yeah. Um, currently, we're doing more traditional investment rental structures. Uh, you know, as, as a startup, we can't do everything all at once. So the first thing we want to be able to do is prove the model for both a community and real estate perspective. 
as the foundation <laughs> to be able to, to invest time and money and to, you know, there's, there's legal work in order to get into these ownership structures. I think the other piece of that is that one of the failures, I think, of, of certain community models is, is um, coupling ownership with community right off the bat, that to, to come together in community and build a culture of shared interests and values is a, a significant undertaking. And then to fold into that home ownership, which is also a significant undertaking that has a lot of baggage around it and emotional or emotional attachment. Um, I, I think it can work, and it, it takes time. Um, but that we're excited about how to decouple those two, and how to have the cultural community model be independent of the ownership model, but then connecting it where people can start to you know buy shares or own pieces of it, and maybe not even have that directly connected to their residency. So it's an investment in the place they live that can stay with them whether they're living there or not. So I think that's sort of our long-term thinking around how we can empower ownership while also creating healthy communities. Because uh, the other thing we want to design for is, or design out is, you know, one of the sort of failure scenarios of communities. You have a person or a group that's hold, holding on to living somewhere because they're economically and financially tied to it long past when maybe they even want to be a part of it. And so allowing people what we call uh, social liquidity, giving them social liquidity to, to join and then leave uh, and not have their finances tied to that. So. Do you have a question? Yeah, I this is maybe related to the uh, ownership model you discussed, but I'm curious uh, what you thought or how much you thought about how uh, like a pool of applicants for one of your houses might be selected uh, to eventually live together, um, whether it's kind of self-organized within that group or how, how you kind of balance the needs of different people and, make, and choosing who gets out of where with that. Yeah, it, it's sort of self-organized, but what we do is we choose a core team of people. Um, in some ways, they select themselves because there's only a certain profile of person who's like crazy enough to want to spend the next three months of their lives building this community, and so they're, they're really passionate about that. Um, and so we call them catalysts, and, and they're the ones who actually make the decisions about who's going to live in the community. Um, we, we decided that pretty early on, like we're, we're not going to be as like a company choosing who should live together. Um, and so that's a big part, like we try to be fairly back end. Um, we definitely support with a lot of the hands on stuff, but we really view ourselves more as like empowering a group to build their own community. Hi, um, my name is Marissa. I really appreciate what you're doing, and I'm probably, this is for Ben and Jay, I think, but maybe Lonnie too. I think I'm probably someone who would want to live in one of your houses, but at the same time, it does sound a lot like gentrification. And I'm wondering, are rents like comparable or accessible um, to folks in the neighborhood, or, um, you know, what, what could make it more accessible? And also, are you doing outreach to connect more with the community so there are relationships there and not a lot of tension or just like how are you integrating? <laughs> Jay and I share everything. <laughs> <laughs> you have figured it out already. Um, in terms of right, right now we're, we're coming in uh, about market rent and not do the economics of the, the project. Um, we're not giving the investors any sort of crazy returns. Um, I think long term, some of these deeper structures, sort of common space structures where we can pull in other sources of capital, potentially take land off the market, um, potentially have more impact investors that are okay with a, a, a lower return or CDFIs and other types. And that, that's one thing we're doing in this project. We're working with the Community Development Finance Institution up the obvious one? Yeah, uh, to do the <laughs> lending, which is great because they're, they're benevolent to value-based, vision-driven uh, projects and companies. Uh, but we're, we, you know, J Jay and I are definitely homies to the core. We're like full-on wanting to get as values-driven as we can, and then we're dealing with the reality of, of having one foot in vision and one foot in reality. And so, like, one of the process, one of, one of our learnings has been patience and realizing 
we can only take one step at a time. So I think we want to head to a place where we can offer, you know, uh, low market rents, um, and potentially there's structures out there that could, that could accelerate that for us. But for now, we're kind of dealing with the market situation. And then do you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the the gentrification question is like something that's constantly on our minds, and as you as we unpack the spreadsheets and the legal code and the building code, it's like, okay, like how do you do this? Like we would like part of buying this building in the place where it was was. We, that was the only property that would fit the model and that we could actually afford to buy. And so in some ways, like, we're being pushed out by crazy prices in different you know, parts of Berkeley or um, Oakland that might sort of initially house the group of people that we have currently. And so I don't have the solution to that. And I think that it's sort of our our vision to um, have. I, I think the, the the difference between gentrification and people living in a, in a in a diverse community is that the conversations that aren't happening, and so I think both inviting the existing community into our space and going around and meeting the community is the first step, and that's all that we can do. And um, it's already started happening, and um, and I think November is, is a really great opportunity for us to continue to do that. And I know that part of why we were really excited to choose the catalyst that we chose was that that's one of their core values, and they're really excited to be active in that process. Um, so it's an experiment, and you know, it's sort of like Ben was saying. It's like there's there's practicality of like our time is limited, and you can't do everything, and um, you take it one step at a time. Thank you. I'm afraid we are running out of time, but I want to give Lonnie a chance to say any final words if if she has any. If not, that's cool. Talk to me. <laughs> Talk to her. And just to, I think, in, ending on this note, it's important because this is a really complex question. And so obviously we leave it open. Also acknowledging that as a panel of all white people and the room itself, we don't have the answer to this question, actually. So just, you know, putting that out there that, you know, it's more than just doing outreach, like we need to continue grappling with this. And, and I'm happy that this conversation is taking place in the larger context of this whole convergence where it's not just about housing, it's about racial justice, it's about the way money is created, you know, it's connected to all of these issues. So thank you very much. As a person of color, I'd like to say one more thing, particularly because I'm in an environment where it's 99% white, right? Um, and I, I want to say, yeah, um, yeah, these voices, voices like mine aren't given that mature time. Um, I have a very simple solution to that. You know, you said that your networks right now don't accommodate this kind of diversity. There are incredibly amazing communities of color in the Bay Area, amazing dance communities, music communities. I mean, I can think of an amazing power couple right now, Cecil Carter and okay. Candy Martinez, who are the most amazingly open and diverse, diversity of people you can help to meet, and a very easy way to organically bring other people into the enterprise that you're building is to step out, step out of your comfort zone. You know, so usually it's the people of color that come in and you know, kind of token few that acclimate to what's happening in the liberal, progressive communities. But how about? white people going and stepping into those communities more often. I don't see enough of that. And that's a great way to organically build community where then, wow, oh, she's great, I love her. Then you're friends. Then you think, wow, I'm going to leave my house. Maybe you can be you know? So I think that's... So can you make an introduction? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's simple that, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. absolutely. Thank there you for saying that. There are people that love diversity. You know, yeah. They're not just in their... And I'm probably over over stereotyping myself just to
to make an example of myself. It's not that like I don't know anybody who's not white. <laughs> I have tons of friends who are, but I'm just like you know trying to actually show that that is a challenge for us. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you all. Let's give a round of applause to our. Friends.